Fellow councillors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee held on the 16th of July 2024. Um, in opening the meeting, I want to greet the new councillors on this committee, which is um, Councillor Helen Hadley, uh, Pat Pallett, um, Natalie Statham, Paul Turner, and um, Andy Wells. We have had, um, and if I can just remind members that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, no doubt with thousands of viewings by this time tomorrow. I'm fairly clear about that. Um, we have had apologies from uh, Marie Bailey, um, Natalie Statham, who is at her graduation, I understand, this evening, from uh, Ben Clark, who, for reasons that escape me, finds the beaches of Greece more appealing than this committee. I don't get that. I don't understand it. Jason Jones and Andy Wells will be late for this meeting, about 15 minutes or so. Carol Dean has kindly agreed to step in for Ben Clark, who is to be here in his role as portfolio holder for a couple of the items. Do we have any other apologies? I don't think we do. Thank you very much. Uh, the first item on the agenda is an, the appointment of a vice chair for this committee. Um, from the chair, um, I'd like to nominate someone who has the experience and the background and the insight to be a very effective vice chair. And I'd like to nominate Councillor Rosie Claymore. Do I have a seconder for that proposition? Councillor Doyle, thank you. Are there, are there any other nominations for Vice Chair? Can I, all those in favour, please show. I don't know whether to congratulate you or not, <laughs> Councillor Claymore, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the third item, the minutes of the previous meeting. Now, in consultation uh, with council colleagues, it would appear that I was the only person here who was at that meeting. And I'm fairly convinced on my own mind it's a true and accurate record of what went on, and it would appear that I'm entitled to say so, and we go on to sign the minutes. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's right. So we will take those as read. Thank you very much. Moving on, then, um, to declarations of interest. Um, does anyone have any personal or prejudicial interest in any of the matters to be discussed? Nope. In that case, um, I will move on then to item four, which is update. Um, it's got a five on here and it's four on there. Um, which is update from the chair. Um, there are only a um, couple of things. The Staffordshire County Council's Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee is meeting tomorrow. Um, so if you want to um, observe that meeting or to look at the agenda, it is on their website. And in fact, I think you've sent a link out to it now. Um, it is an interesting meeting and what they discuss does impact on us eventually. Unfortunately, I can't get to that meeting. I would normally go, but I'm unable to get there tomorrow. Right, um, one other item. We, have, we currently have a Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee meeting scheduled for the 26th of November. With the permission of the committee, I'd like to move that to the 27th of November, if possible because we have a number of officers who are unable to attend that meeting. So is everybody content with that move one day back to the 27th? Good, thank you very much. The next item is responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee and I have none to report at this meeting. Um, I next item is consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council, and I have none to report at this meeting. Item 8, update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. 
we would normally get those matters referred to us in a digest from the county and at this point no, gi no digest has been received. Um, there is a county representative um, on this committee which is Councillor Jason Jones but unfortunately we have received apologies from Councillor Jones today and we have not had a report. So I hope that um, what I will do is try to ensure that we have better relationships with Staffordshire County Council as we go forward. The next item then, and I'm not clear at this point whether it's eight or nine, um, is the Armed Forces Covenant update. So, <laughs> yes, I know. Can I welcome Councillor Lewis Smith as the portfolio holder and um, Assistant Director Joe Sands and I'll hand over to you Councillor Smith to do your report. Thank you very much Chair. Okay so I'm here to uh, update everyone on the Armed Forces Covenant update for 2024. I won't bore you by going through the executive, ex executive summary, you've got it all in front of you in your documents. Um, the Tamworth Armed Forces Covenant plan was endorsed by Cabinet in July 2023 with the agreement that an annual update will be provided to health and wellbeing scrutiny annually. So this is the update for 2024. I'd like to thank all the officers that have been involved and everyone that's been involved in this update as well. So thank you very much for, for everyone's hard work. Okay, so some of the key successes in this year. The Council have successfully achieved the Employer Recognition Silver Award, which will be presented at the National Memorial Arboretum in 2020, <coughs> sorry, September 2024. This will enhance our support to armed forces communities by improving policies, including automatic interviews for veterans and forces family members meeting the minimum job requirements, advertising vacancies on the force at specific websites, increased pay annual leave for, reser for reservists, which meets the gold standard, so we're already um, making some progress towards reaching the gold standard as well, uh, ERS scheme. Events were arranged for D-Day 80 celebrations with the Royal British Legion Tamworth branch, so thank you to Councillor Clements for her involvement in that. Uh, a commitment has been made to recognise and celebrate annual Armed Forces Day events with free admission for serving and retired service personnel and half price for their family to the Tamworth Castle. Put in place compulsory training for all staff to raise awareness of our commitment to the Armed Forces Covenant. We provided over £6,000 grant funding to Tamworth and Litchfield Sea Cadets to meet core funding costs, and a £10,000 grant was awarded to the Staffordshire Free for a permanent memorial in the castle, the castle grounds to the three local men that were killed on active service in Iraq. So the recommendations to the, uh, to the committee are, number one, endorse the updated Tamworth Borough Council Armed Forces Covenant Work Plan, and number two, recognise and affirm the awards to Tamworth Borough Council of the Silver Employment Recognition Scheme Award. And I'll pass over to the officers if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, Joe, do you want to add anything to that? Um, not at this time, just to say thank you to my team and, and a lot of work's been gone through with Human Resources and, and, and my team specifically. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that this represents a, a very good news story. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm personally very proud of what we've done in terms of the Armed Forces Covenant. I think we've done a really uh, splendid job in taking it forward. But are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Turner. Um, and item number nine, the Armed Forces Covenant update. The action plan states that Councillor Lewis Smith is to be the Armed Forces champion. Um, is the portfolio holder aware of the roles and responsibilities contained within the Constitution regarding champions? Um, can I just very quickly, um, it's been pointed out to me that a member of the cabinet cannot be a champion. Um, so we will need to address that issue elsewhere. How can we address that, Joe? Any thoughts? Yep. 
My, my understanding was that that's specifically why that is now within the portfolio arrangement. It's the specific mention of the Armed Forces Covenant. So whether you want to review the word champion and just make that council representative, because it is now within a portfolio named with a named councillor against it. So the suggestion is that we rename the role rather than be a champion to be a council representative. I think it's really important. It's just occurred to me, is that not a policy issue, then a policy change if we're going to rename it or give the role to somebody else? So are you saying this decision was taken last year? It would appear the decision was taken last year. Council Claymore. I seem to recall that there was some decision made or some discussion around um, the portfolio holder becoming the champion because it, I think it was the previous portfolio holder was a veteran, if I remember. It is actually useful that this has been pointed out. We do need to get this sorted. Whether we could endorse the work, well, leave a motion to amend the recommendation to endorse the work plan subject to the removal of Councillor Lewis Smith as champion. You know, we can look at rewording, but we, we can't, I suppose you can't technically endorse it in its current state because so it's we a champion and it contradicts the so constitution. We can't do that one, but we can do that one. Yes. Okay, it seems fairly clear we can't endorse the work plan until there's been a change. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, just reading on uh, a motion uh, referring to last year's Cabinet that I picked up on. Uh, there was a motion to recommend to the Cabinet that an appropriate champion be selected, and where, and where possible, this should be a member of the veterans' community. So that did go to Cabinet. Well, that would be me, wouldn't it? Yes, I think that's safe. So what, we can't endorse that as it stands, but we can do two. Yeah, we can definitely do two. Um, so you can't, you you can't not endorse the recommendation. What you would have to do is, yeah, they wouldn't, you wouldn't move or second it. You know, no one can move or second it. You can't do a negative of a recommendation. Yeah. You can't sort of, um, yeah. Okay, so as things stand, the advice is we can't move recommendation one until the work plan has been amended, but we can move recommendation two. So that's my proposal. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you. All those in favour? Was, was everyone finished? Oh, no, I think it's okay. Sorry? Sorry? Have you finished? Question. Yeah, I think so. 
Okay, um, that was a bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be, but it's uh, it is helpful to get these governance matters resolved. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, moving on then to the next item, which is the uh, disabled adaptations policy. This one has been to this committee more than one. Hello. I've got a couple more questions actually. Before, yeah, about the art co covenant. Um, in section 1.3 of the action plan, the word consider is used to describe events for the VE day. Um, for such a prominent anniversary, should the word be changed a plan for the events rather than consider? I'm happy to change that plan because the, the planning is already started because we, we, there's a, a first meeting about that so that yeah, can be yeah, it's, right, it's in the planning it is in the planning mode exactly. and there will be things planned so yeah that can change thank you Joe and you had another question councillor sorry to um, yeah the budget allocates allocated funds to the RBL for the Armed Forces Day were these funds used do we have record? And if possible, can we have a breakdown of their allocation? A question for the officers, I think. That there was some funds allocated to the RBL. And this was specifically for Armed Forces Day, Councillor Turner. Yes. Yeah. So, so could we look into that and find out if there were funds and it was used accordingly and properly and proportionately etc cetera, etc cetera. so I'd, re I'd really like to put a motion forward that we recommend to cabinet that they continue to financially support the RBL in organising Armed Forces Day. Has anybody got any um, comments on that? Because there are other organisations involved in the welfare of veterans, not just the RBL. Um, so that may be something that the committee wants to take into consideration. So is there, uh, does anybody want to comment on that as a proposal? Is there a seconder for it? But it's a useful comment and we will look at that because um, I'm not quite sure where we do support at the moment. Well, maybe we can put it on. We can certainly investigate it and bring it back to committee. Yes, we can do that. We just need clarity on it, don't we? To see where it did come from. Um, because, as I indicated, there are other organisations that support veterans. Yeah. Uh. Obviously, if they're not going to get money and they need to plan for next year, that, you know, I, I want the event to be a success, like I think we all do. But obviously, you can't make it. We will seek clarity on that. Are there any other matters on the Armed Forces Covenant update, which is where we started? Um, no. Okay, we can. I just want to, if Joe wants to come back for the violence work, I know they did the violence thing. Yeah. 
out with talk out with them or something. Okay, we can tend to move on then to the disabled adaptations policy. Is there anything else? No. Um, the disabled adaptations policy has been to this committee before, um, and it res it it received a thorough, I think, <coughs> testing at the last meeting. Um, there are two reports coming to committee today, one under the exempt section and this one that we're just about to discuss now. So if I can welcome the Assistant Director, uh, Paul Weston, and the um, Disabled Adaptation Manager, Lucy Mitchell, and Carol Dean, who's Councillor Carol Dean, who's stepping in for the portfolio holder um, to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, agenda item 10, then, you've got the report in front of you. It's for the committee to review and consider the proposed draft housing assistance policy at Appendix A for the delivery of mandatory and discretionary disabled facilities grants prior to submission to Cabinet for full approval and adoption for private sector delivery. And in the interim period of not having a council adaptations policy, consider the policy foundations within this policy for council delivery. So in addition, review and consider the interim policy position statement for council adaptations in scenarios where the council can reject, refuse, append permission. For example, where the tenants are intending to purchase their properties, are in arrears or facing eviction action, or are looking to move home and the exceptional circumstances for applying the discretionary is at Appendix B. So the recommendations in front of you are one, that the committee review and consider the proposed assistance provided by the council under the draft housing assistance policy. Point two, comment on the inclusion of various discretionary schemes proposed. Three, formally recommend the policy to cabinet for approval and adoption in August. Four, allow for utilization of the policy to cover council adaptations until such a time as a separate policy can be prepared and submitted to this committee for review. And number five, recommend the interim policy position statement for council adaptations, Appendix B, to Cabinet for formal adoption. And as it says in the executive summary, the provision of adaptations to people's houses, as we all know as councillors, is a life-changing thing for the person and the family and all of us because it makes such a difference. So I will pass over to our officers if they want to expand on this. Thank you, Council Dean. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to say thanks to Lucy and her team because I know they put a lot of effort into this, uh, into developing both the policy and getting us to where we are in terms of the delivery side of stuff. Uh, I think as we picked up before, uh, it's taken a lot of work to get us to where we are today. I think really for me, it's, it is about key now to get this policy over the line. Uh, it does mention in there about the transparency, making the whole process very transparent and how we operate. But I think more importantly than that, we do now have people who are waiting who probably do need to access some of those discretionary funds. Uh, and I think it's important now to be able to sort of get this policy through uh, across the line and that, so we can start helping those people where they're needed. Uh, hopefully we've addressed those uh, queries and comments that have been made in previous scrutiny committee meetings. As has been sort of mentioned, there is a further uh, paper in the confidential section that talks more about the overall service delivery, uh, and that talks about staffing and personnel type issues, which is why it's a confidential item, uh, which is not really sort of for, for a public meeting. And so the policy side really is the public-facing document that we're that you know, would be presented to the public that they can refer to and understand what what we do, how we do it, what they would be entitled to, and how the process works. Uh, so, like I say, I think it is just important, really, sort of, you know, to stress, how, you know, that there are people now who really do need some of these adaptations and potentially will need some of those discretionary grants. That's not to say we're not delivering adaptations as it stands, but there are some elements now where I think the policy is the bit that's needed to move that across the line. If there's any sort of, I suppose, more technical questions, I am going to defer those to Lucy because she lives and breathes it. 
she knows this inside and out uh, more so than I could ever do it justice, to be honest with you. Thank you. Lucy, do you want to, uh, to add anything? Not at this stage, thank you, but happy to take questions. Any questions from the committee? Councillor Turner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of observations as I get my head around this uh, committee. Um, what sort of expert input, i.e. Um, Veterans UK or RBL, or advice did officers receive when they were came up uh, with point C, which in the report says... Uh, they are in receipt of an armed forces compensation scheme award at a tariff level of one to eight, or they are in receipt of a war pension at 80% plus a co constant attendance allowance. So in terms of advice, none, but that is the government recommendation when we look within the, the documentation. So that's where that's come from. into that was uh, it states um, levels one to eight uh, how many levels are there uh, and the next question is uh, does the officer know how many sorts of conditions this policy will exclude So the policy gives priority to armed forces personnel who have been discharged as a result of medical reasons and their disability is a result of those reasons and they're asking for the adaptations. So it's very difficult to come up with a figure or categorisations because it's all individual. And finally, um, I was just having a read of this and trying to get my head around it. By making it levels one to eight in the policy, are they restricting conditions with some examples being high energy transfer of gunshot wound, deeply penetrating missile fragmentation or other penetrating wounds? Of all the con combination of these with clinical significant damage of soft tissues and structures and vascular and uh, neurological structures to the head and neck, torso, limb, which have required or may be expected to require operative treatment with the resi residual permanent significant function and limitation and restrictions. Now I've got a list of all these which I'll share with you. Um, yeah, th no, thank you for that. So the, the wording in there is where we can claim back money from the government for disabled facilities grant purposes. So if we approve an application for an adaptation, that's the government requirement to claim that money back. So in terms of your list, what I would say is, within any case, we've got a policy foundation. However, there, there is then the discretion element. So when we make decisions, we can't fetter our discretion. So we would always consider if there are extenuating circumstances or things that don't necessarily fall into those categories because we can't legislate for everything. If there are additional things that we need to consider, we will. Thank you, Jess. Um, what I was looking at really is to put a motion forward that the cabinet re remove lines A, uh, sorry, C and D, I'll put my glasses on, uh, from section 3.9 in the draft. Because they seem to contradict that your is, you are, are you in receipt of the, the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme Award at a tariff le level of one to eight? Well, I think there's one to 16 actually, from my research or you're in receipt of a war pension. Uh, they, they seem a little bit, you know, two benefits there. And I go back to that's the government requirement for where we can claim it back. So I can really look at the wording, but I've copied it word for word in terms of where we can claim it back and not. 
Um, and the reason for that is Tamworth is likely to run out of DFG funding at some point. I don't think I need to share that with, with the group. I think historically that's always been the case. And we don't want to be in a position when we're prioritising one group of people above somebody else and, and I'm having to approve a grant for somebody when I can't for somebody else. Whereas if we can claim the money back... Any other questions or observations? We just confirm if, if Councillor Turner's putting forward that motion that we've been withdrawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good luck to us. Which he, he said he was putting forward a motion to remove line C and D. I just wanted to clarify that he's. Yeah, can I just clarify, Councillor Turner, um, you did suggest you were putting forward a motion to, to rule out C and D. Are you now putting that forward as a motion? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I say I've looked at the, the two wordings and I think it, it, now that I understand it, it's got to break you from, from the legislation. I'm just thinking, is it fit for purpose? I mean, I don't think clarification is required. I have to admit, I'm slightly struggling to see what the conflict is there because uh, it's. it's, it's it seems to me that it, by putting C and D, you cover a, a range of people who have conditions directly related yeah, to their back, service. If you go back to my first question or second question, which is all about the state of levels, it's going to review because it's one place. It's exactly one to sixteen. I just want to make sure that before the closure starts, that's correct. It's just in one place. And, and that goes back to the government definition of those. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, may I apologise for my lateness to everybody. It um, wasn't really my fault, I suppose, but I still think I ought to owe you an apology for the accident on the M42. Um, first of all, I'll start with a couple of comments or a couple of observations, if I might. I, 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 I did read the document. I, I, I even read the appendices as well, um, and I can see there's been a lot of work gone into that to try and provide what I believe is a much needed service. Um, I, I have um, experience of, of, of those, not directly, but through friends of friends of those how those needs are. And in my uh, efforts of walking around knocking on doors, um, I've seen a lot of people who, who do def definitely need that help. I also see that Massive efforts have been made um, since the for the changeover of the service, and, and I think that that represents a, a, a sort of a big challenge, I guess. Um, so I have sort of two questions that come out of that in many ways, and it's not meant to be a, a criticism or anything like that. It's just really so I understand the reality. Is that first of all, uh, is this is a policy? This is how we're going to do it, but. Is how, how much? What does that mean in terms of implementation? Are we, are we doing this, or, 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 or is that something we still have to do? What does that challenge actually look like in terms of implementation? If you could sort of paint a picture for me on that, and then the second one is, I think we'd all agree around these tables that 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 um, as has been said, it's painful that there is so little resource available um, to those people in need, and. I, I'm not quite sure practically how we assess those needs and make sure that, that money is spent in the right sort of place. Uh, I know there is a backlog um, of of people, and effectively that gives you a, a list of people to sort of triage, I think is the word, or, or, or assess, or whatever that correct word is. But I'm not sure what happens when new people come onto that list. If you, for example, have a new person comes onto that list who is clearly very much in need, may, might, might even be somebody out of the armed forces who's, who's had severe wounds, etc. Um, I don't think the answer is we've run out of money, if you see what I mean. Um, well, I'd like to not think the answer was, but I'm not sure what the answer is. So uh, those are my two, two sort of questions, really. Thank you. You might need to remind me of the second one as I go through the first one. But in terms of the implementation, there's already a legislative legislative framework for disabled facilities grants so we are operating in accordance with the legislation the policy just outlines to our customers the terms and conditions that they can expect around that but what it also does is offer the discretion that the council can offer people so there's four discretionary grants in there that we wouldn't be able to offer without a policy framework so those those are the positives of it um, 
So we are already implementing most in terms of the, the mandatory disabled facilities grant. They are going through as the legislation requires. It's just transparency. It, if somebody challenges, we've got the policy framework there. In terms of the discretionary schemes, well, they would be quite easy to set up because generally they're linked off the back of a mandatory scheme. So it, we would already know the customer. It's just an additional piece of work to get that approved through the panel um, where we've got those cases that fall within those grounds. So it's not a huge amount of work to put those additional things in place. I think that came to when I was reading the documentation, I, I got confused in my head because I saw um, a lot of words talking about essentially the administrative, sorry, I can't even say, it, the administration of grants and fees, which is one thing, um, but clearly delivery is the thing that we, we need. And I, I say I did, if I can say these things, but um, clearly. I read the appendices and I've seen the efforts made in it. So I'm, I'm talking about what is the challenge for delivery of the things on the ground? Because we, I don't believe we've been doing that bit. Is that right? I'm, 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 I'm I we are now delivering grants. It's, it has been a journey to get to that point, to lay those foundations, to make sure we're delivering a safe grant adaptation service. Um, so yeah, there's been a journey to get there, but we are on site with jobs at the moment and we are moving through. Um, that's going to gain pace as we move forward. Um, it, it's been, as I say, laying the foundations and getting the right staff in place to be able to deliver. And that's where we are now. And just to remind you, my second question was really uh, 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 about um, how do we prioritise effectively a moving list, I, I guess, if I was to... Yeah, so everybody that comes on to the, the new enquiries we get, we would triage within six weeks to make sure that they're, they're eligible and can move forward um, with whether they need means test or their passporting. And then we're doing what we call a triage plus process now. So while they're waiting for caseworker resource, we are actively looking for landlord permission if they're in registered provider properties or if they're owner occupiers doing the background work and getting them on the waiting list for the OT. So by the time we come round to pick them up, they will have had that OT assessment. So we're, we're meeting them in the middle. So we're trying to save and work smarter um, to, to gain some time. But anybody that comes onto the list will have a phone call from us within six weeks. I guess I'm not getting, sorry, I'm not having to go up. What my concern is that if we have somebody who um, becomes known to us, I'm, I'm not, struggling with the words at the moment, but some who, who is clearly needs some quite serious help. I don't think we want the answer to say we haven't got any more money. Um, so I would sort of ask if it would be possible to have some sort of contingency. I know the answer is about money. I know that. But I wonder if it would be possible to have some sort of, I don't know, contingency fee for those sorts of people. I don't know if that need is needed, if it's needed, but I, I'm, I'm trying to treat this with pure compassion that, that I, I don't want anybody who really needs that help to not have that help. That's, that's the first thing. I have one other, one other question. I'm sorry. I'm, I do apologize um, for taking your time. Um, and this may be something I just don't misunderstand. I heard the news this morning and, and, and somebody made this rash statement that a number of local authorities do not have the money to meet their legal requirements in respect of um, uh, disabled people. I, I'm not entirely, I did some research today, but I'm not entirely sure what those are. There is a lot of those, but I, I, I would be concerned if we were not able to meet our legal requirements. Is that, is, that, is that just spin and nonsense, or is there anything that we should know about? Um, so in terms of the monetary position, we've got a backlog of cases, and so we've, we've got a bit of a surplus at the moment. It's anticipated, based on a historical position, that we will run out of funding. Yeah. Now, there's several things that you can do as a council in regards to that, in terms of your priority and budget setting. So we will be setting that out to you in due course um, when the budget setting process comes, if we, we are likely to run out, and you can make a strategic decision on that based on other priorities. Um, I think the other thing is our settlement in Tamworth is far lower than other areas um, and I think that that's some work that needs to be done. I know our portfolio holder is very keen to flag that higher up 
to government because that hasn't been changed since 2008 and is based on a very antiquated calculation of how much the council put in and then the government will match fund. So it, that, that's problematic but at a higher level um, and needs some work and input from you all to, to make that those changes happen and it was recommended in 2018-2019 that there were changes to the formula and that hasn't happened. So that's one of the things. I think Staffordshire again it's unequal, the balance is unequal across Staffordshire so whether we can work together as a partnership across Staffordshire um, to make that um, a fairer and not such a postcode lottery for residents within Staffordshire would also be welcomed. Um, but in terms of what we're doing, I think a lot of it sits within that development plan this after, later on in terms of trying to make the most of what we've got and eke that out further. And the sooner we do that, the better, um, because I don't want to be paying more for adaptations because that's somebody else that misses out. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on that point of um, us not having enough money, specifically us not having enough money. Councillor Clark has put a letter through to um, government um, highlighting this and asking that our um, grant is, get, is reviewed. And I think this is something that we can take through to all the things that we sit on now. I can definitely take it through to the Staffordshire Leaders Board and the, the other um, things that I sit on and keep lobbying because I think we won't be the only one while it is disproportionate across the county there will be winners and losers and the other losers will be just as keen as us to get something changed yeah I mean and this this committee did put a recommendation to cabinet last year that that the um, formula was unfair and unbalanced and there were actually some local authorities who couldn't spend all their grant whilst we didn't have enough to meet needs Oh yeah. Oh yes. So um, th this is not this is not a new challenge, but it's a challenge that we're now I think ready to take on full on, and and to go. And uh, I have to be fair to the previous administration; they had a bash at it as well, and it didn't get very far. Councillor Doyle. Uh, just a point of clarity. <coughs> um, I was under the impression that the Staffordshire County Council set the limit of the amount of DFGs that each uh, borough or district gets. Um, the government sets the total amount of funding available, but it's the County Council that breaks it up. Um, and in reference to uh, areas that have been unable to spend theirs, they tend to be uh, where the population are more affluent or younger. Um, and it's, uh, oh, yeah, uh, and it also goes with population density as well because that can have a big impact on it. So um, I've heard it discussed before. And for clarity, if you can just confirm, that's the process. Thank you. Can you confirm, Paul, please? Second point to a comment, so I can't really answer on that one. In terms of the allocation, it's set by central government. It goes to county council, and they just passport it straight through to us. So it's not county council making the decision. For, for whatever reason, it goes to them first, and they just basically passport that straight through to us. So the amount that gov central government allocate just does that round sort of through route to us but we get the full amount that they that they sort of allocate and they publish that every year and they just send out the full list of allocations i think it's a public document uh, that sets out how much each local authority gets and we get our shared and county council just passport that straight through to us so it's not set by county council uh, they just route it through Um, the Better Care Fund, with the theory being that housing, health, social care should be more joined up, and this sits as part of that, despite being devolved as a housing function. So that's why it goes through County Council and then down to us. Thank you for your responses. Councillor so well. Sorry. Do we do we provide da do we have data or do we provide them data with how many people are eligible for that f or, or something like that? No. 
No, and, and no. It's, so it's, it's set by government. As I say, it's a very antiquated formula based on how much the local authority would put in in 2008, which was around 40% of it, and then government would top up the extra 60%. It is based on some kind of formula around population density and disability data, but as you can imagine in 2008 to where we are now, it's very outdated and that landscape's probably changed somewhat. Um, I think the other thing to add is Tamworth's got a very difficult to adapt housing stock and build costs have, have only gone one way during, yeah. during those years. And while the grant has gone up year on year, it, it doesn't, it isn't enough to cover though that uplift in build costs. And these are discussions we've had many times before at this committee, unfortunately. Are there any other questions on this, Councillor? Yeah, just to uh, clarify on those items of legislation that were um, C and D. Could you, can I have a copy? You may. I can find it in my emails because I, I have to contact foundations who are the, the government approved agency for um, DFG and home improvement okay. agencies. So yeah, I'll get that over to you. In terms of numbers of people on the, the waiting list, so across the two service areas, so council adaptations and DFG, there's 300 people on, on the waiting list, yeah. Now they're at various stages, so some are at, some work on site and some we're just tying up the ends of through to the very early stages of just coming on and doing the triage process. So they're all at various different stages, yeah. Um, we've got over 50 at the moment waiting for the OT assessment. Yeah, we have been on a journey on this for some time and we have made a lot of progress, but clearly there's some way to go yet. But I do want to pay tribute to the officers for the huge amount of work that they've put in over the last year to make progress on this. Now we do have uh, some recommendations um, in front of us, unless there are any further, further comments from anyone. Is anyone um, prepared to move the recommendations as they currently stand? Councillor Doyle, thank you. Anyone prepared to second? Thank you, Councillor Claymore. Any alterations to those? No, all those in favour, please show. Any abstentions? None, any against, no. Thank you very much to everybody for taking part in that debate and thank you to the officers for being so candid in their responses. Um, is the, the next item is the forward plan. Is there anything on the forward plan that people wish to comment upon? Right, there being... Uh, None at the moment. I'll move on to working group updates. I have none at the moment. We have no working groups established at the moment. I do wonder whether it would be sensible to establish a um, disabled facilities grant working group so that we can begin to support the officers in carrying this through. Would, any, would anybody um, think that is a good plan, that we should do that? Okay, if we can... Uh, have a talk afterwards about who wants to be on that working group. Can we uh, can we make that happen electronically? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the next item, if there's nothing else on the uh, on the work plan, the next item is the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. Um, and I have to remind the committee that the next meeting is in September and we currently have the housing strategy update, which we now have twice a year, isn't it, instead of all the time, which we used to have, which feels like a huge improvement. Um, is there anything to be added to that meeting in September? Okay, Doug. Um, has everybody seen a copy of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Work Plan? Has everybody had that? Good. Thank you. Okay, and that moves me on to the next item, which is exclusions of the press and public. 
If you want to go and have a cup of tea or a lie down while I read this out. In accordance with the provision of the local authorities' executive arrangements, meeting and access to information England regulations 2012 and section 100A4 of the Local Government Act of 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A to the Act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. Anybody be prepared to move that if they can remember what it was? Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Seconded. All those in favour? 